Dr. Elizabeth Kahn is uh, teaches uh, in the school. Do you still teach? Yeah, in the School of Government and International Affairs. She's a political theorist, basically, at uh, the University of Durham. And um, she has been working on uh, notions of structural injustice and uh, is writing a new book on that. Is that right? Yeah. We're excited to see that. Um, she has published um, several articles and also a, a book uh, introducing political philosophy, a policy-driven approach, which I guess, um, is that a co-author, co-edited? Co-author. Co-author, wow, with um, Andrew Walton and Tom Parr, who spoke here, and Will Abel. Uh, which was is was an Oxford University Press that book that has already come out, and several other articles on global poverty, on social structure and human rights, and injustice and collectivization in world politics, um, and structural approaches to human rights and so forth. So she fits right in our uh, main areas of interest here at the Center for Global Ethics and Politics. And we're delighted uh, to welcome Beth today. Um, she's promised to come in person at some time in the future, so we'll have to have a follow-up. And in any case, this talk is entitled Global Injustice and the Political Action Paradox. And I'm really delighted to uh, welcome Beth to our um, colloquia series here at the center. Beth. Hello everyone, um, thank you so much. I First I wanted to start by saying thanks to Carol for inviting me. I really appreciate this opportunity to talk to the group and um, to talk to him about something I've been working on. Uh, so let's, um, let's go from the beginning. Okay, so the project I wanted to talk about to you about today is entitled Global Injustice and the Political Action Paradox. So this um, discussion came out of my book, which Carol was talking about. In the book, I'm interested in poverty understood as a global structural injustice. And what happens is in the book, I lay out why I think we need to think about it that way and what obligations I think we have regarding to it. Now, towards the close of the book, what happens is I tackle a number of possible objections to this approach, possible objections to my theory. And I think one of the key problems with any approach that, in, that recommends working with others to bring about political change is that you face something that I'm gonna to call today the political action paradox. So the problem here is you're always going to face an objection which comes in the form of, why should we engage in political action? Why should we put efforts and energy into political action if we're incredibly unlikely to make any significant difference to outcomes? Because the kind of political action I'm recommending is the kind of mass political action, the kind of political action that involves ordinary people coming together to try and um, hold power holders to account and bring about structural change. Now, the problem with this is any particular individual is incredibly unlikely to have a significant impact. And so one of the objections that any account that encourages this kind of political action has to face is, do we really have reason to engage in this kind of action based on um, trying to bring about change, given that we're, for any an individual, it's incredibly unlikely that they will make change. So that's the general theme of today. So what I'm going to talk about today is I'm going to introduce the, this as a paradox. I'm going to think a little bit about why this presents a paradox and why it's particularly interesting to people who are keen on the idea of political action and mass political action more generally. Then I'm going to think about various ways in which we might model this problem. So how can we idealize this problem in such a way as to make it manageable to think about as a problem in moral philosophy? Then I'm gonna look at a few ways in which we might be able to stop the problem before it begins. Could we possibly avoid the paradox? Now this can be a bit strange for some people because a lot of people are interested in moral problems just for the um, intellectual puzzle. But as somebody who's interested in political theory and political philosophy, I start from thinking about injustice and I'm really interested in what really should we do about this problem? So if it turns out this paradox doesn't really exist, to me, that's a good, that's a good answer, right? So that's why I think about ways of possibly avoiding or circumventing 
the apparent paradox. Before then, I move on to possible ways to resolve it. So what I'm going to do today is introduce it, think about various models for it, and think about various solutions. And then towards the end, I'm going to start to reveal my hand a little bit more and talk about which solutions I like and how I think we can adjudicate between the various available options for how to diffuse this and suggest a way forward, which I haven't actually taken yet, which is what I want to do next. Um, but before I proceed to do that, I really appreciate some feedback. So I'm hoping to be able to get some useful feedback today. So that's the overall structure of what I'm gonna do. Okay, so introducing the paradox. So as I was saying in the book, I focus on extreme poverty as a global structural injustice, but there are very uh, various other examples of global injustice that might produce a similar puzzle. Now, in many of these cases, uh, we can come up with different sources of obligations. There are different accounts. Some people have aid-based, some people have solidarity-based accounts. Some people have something to do with natural duty of justice. Um, so uh, I focus a lot in the book on the work of Iris Young and this idea of essentially shared forward-looking responsibility, but I developed my own account of obligations with regards to injustice, which is the idea that individuals need to take part in political action as a precaution against their contributing and being complicit in future harms. So that's, that's the model I'm using, but I think that the paradox works for other um, advocates of taking mass political action as well. Okay, so before we get started, what kind of political action am I talking about? Well, we can think about boycotts, we can think about campaigning of various kinds, various forms of direct action. We can also think about um, less dangerous forms like petitioning or voting for candidates that are going to push in a particular direction. We can also think about some sort of um, international trade unionism and organizing. So you can think about all these different political tools that we might want to use. But I think what they have in common is they all involve um, mass political action. They all involve having to bring together a range of different people. Um, in fact, masses of different people. And that's what creates the paradox. The fact that these forms of political action require large numbers to be effective. Okay. So to give a sort of understanding of what the paradox is to begin with, the idea is that resistance to injustice is incredibly important and it requires collective action on a mass scale. So that's just one of my premises here. Um, I don't really want to talk about to what extent that's true or not true, but to get the paradox started, that's the idea. If we want to achieve social justice, we're going to have mass collective action. I think there are various reasons why that is, but it's, it's not something that I want to focus on today. And yet any individual contribution to such, such action is extremely unlikely to have an effect on its success or failure. So it looks like there can't be obligations to take actions which don't make a significant difference to outcomes. Um, and yet it looks like having these mass movements is incredibly important. So what I think is going on here is we've got a conflict, um, which I want to identify as a paradox. So I think at base, this is about two conflicting intuitions. So on the one hand, I think it's quite plausible, and I think this is quite strong, that we can't have a duty to make pointless sacrifices or perform empty gestures. The kind of politics where you sort of perform your beliefs um, in order to make yourself feel better or express yourself seems to me a bit redundant. When we take political action, we want to take it because it's actually yep. going to have some purpose and it's going to make things better. So it's much better to do something useful than just to perform our politics, right? And in fact, if something's going to take energy away from other aspects of our lives and other things that we can do that promote the common good, for example, or um, aid the victims of injustice, it's going to look very hard to justify putting energy, time and resources into engaging in political action that's unlikely to make a significant difference. Okay, but on the other hand, I find it quite convincing that we urgently need mass political movements and the only way for them to happen is for huge numbers of small contributions to come together. They can't work um, without that. Without that, they, they aren't mass political actions. So what I think is going on here is collective and individual reasoning are offering conflicting prescriptions. At the group level, um, we can look at various arguments, but I don't want to get them today. 
that reveal that this kind of mass political action is required in order to create and maintain social justice. Yet on the individual level, it looks like it would be stupid to waste our time on things that don't make a significant difference. So these are the conflicting intuitions, and I actually think that they're both quite powerful. So this sets up um, a paradox. What does it look like? So um, for the model for this, I've looked at a lot of work that actually looks at a different problem, which is voting. But I think some of the arguments transpose over and I've been inspired by some of the arguments from this um, area because I haven't found as many arguments about actual mass political action. It seems like people are much more interested in discussing voting and these kinds of political actions than mass political actions of various kinds. So I've borrowed some stuff. So I've adapted this. So it seems to me, on the one hand, individuals have a reason to engage in political action that is based on that action's contribution to improving political outcomes. So I've made this quite broad. I think that we do have reason to take political action. And I think that reason is based on improving political outcomes. And it's often reasonable for individuals to take part in political action for this reason. Yet at the same time, this is the paradox, for any individual actor, there is only a very small chance that engaging in political action will make a difference to political actions. And that the chance is so small that it wouldn't be reasonable to engage for this reason. So you see the, the contradiction is, is very clearly expressed here. Something's got to give. Okay, so now I'm going to look at two rival ways to model the problem. Um, and I'd be interested to hear which people think is more plausible understanding of what's going on in this case, because I'm not entirely sure that I'm committed to one way of seeing it or the other yet. So, so we could see this as a kind of threshold collective benefit. So there is some discussion of what I like to call essentially aggregative harms. So these are harms that occur only when a quantity or a certain set of quality of actions come together. But what we're looking at here is rather collective benefit. So a threshold case of collective benefit would work like this. We achieve a really good outcome if we get enough contributions to surpass a threshold, such that if we go over the thresholds, the collective benefit occurs. If we don't, the collective benefit doesn't, and we need multiple contributions. So we could view mass political actions of various kinds of being of this form. We need a certain amount of effort, a certain amount of contribution and when a threshold is passed we'll get the political change okay so this way of modeling it suggests that there's a threshold if you get above it the good happens if you get below it the good doesn't happen therefore the reason that you want to take action is if you can make a difference to whether we can cross the threshold but notoriously these cases are complicated because if you've got a mass large number and just one threshold, what's going to happen is either we're going to probably fall short by quite a lot such that um, it, it's not going to happen or we're going to go over by quite a lot. It's really unlikely that we're going to exactly hit that threshold. If we exactly hit that threshold, it means that everyone who contributed, had it not been for their contribution, the threshold wouldn't be met. So then it's, it's really easy to see why they need to take the action, right? However, if we go massively over, it looks like even if I hadn't bothered that day, even if I hadn't showed up for the protest against the war in Iraq, for example, on that day, it wouldn't have mattered because we had enough people anyway to stop the war, say. It's a, it's a hypothetical example, okay? Or the numbers were so low, it was never gonna happen anyway, so the fact that I stayed at home didn't matter. What's incredibly unlikely is that we exactly hit the threshold and that there is a particular threshold whereby the political change occurs, okay? So we might want to model mass political actions aimed at um, lessening structural injustice through various routes on this model. Okay. But we need to make the model a bit clearer um, because it seems to me that there isn't just one goal when it comes to tackling injustices. Normally there's multiple goals. There's normally multiple points at which we get better and better solutions to problems, right? If we're thinking about international agreements, they could cover more or less. They could require higher standards or lower standards. Um, if we think about concessions that governments give, uh, they can be better or worse. And we might think that the level of engagement with mass political action will dictate this. Similarly, if you're thinking about a strike, 
we might think the level of people who take part in said strike is going to have a significant impact on what the employers bring to the table at the negotiations. But there isn't just one thing, which is either we win the strike or we lose. It's much more about how much do employers give us. OK, so it looks like in these kind of mass political action cases, there are multiple thresholds. So we might want to think about it as a threshold collective benefit with multiple thresholds. OK, but we might think that there it's not actually this kind of case at all. And the way I've been talking about the examples and the way we think about the examples seem to suggest that it's incredibly unlikely that there's a particular number of strikers, say, in a particular strike, that once exceeded means that employers will concede X or not. It seems incredibly unlikely that there's some precise threshold. So that if we hit the threshold and pass it, then we, we get our demand. That doesn't seem to be how these things actually work. How things actually seem to work seems to be much more about creating a climate. So if we think about political case, if we think about um, a government and a government's policy, for example, the degree of support that a regime has from those individuals living in the structure over which it rules matters, right? So how unpopular my current government become because of their latest budget is significant to what they do next. They've got an election coming up in a couple of years, they care. Even in regimes that aren't even, um, don't even have elections, the level of public support is important in order to maintain their rule in various ways. And you can see analysis about this and power and how power relies on people's continued obedience and people's um, uh, uh, not opposing the regime in large numbers, for example. So political climate matters and support is an expressed attitude an individual has or fails to have towards a regime where one supports a regime if and only if one expresses that one is content to authorize the regime to govern, right? But we could even break this down to different policies or different ways of going on. But the idea here is the political climate matters for how power is wielded as well as um, who ends up wielding it in various ways. So you might want to take this over to the mass action case. And we might say that the overall level of expressed and acted upon political opinion creates a climate in which political figures and organizations gain power and make decisions and significant changes in demonstrated public opinion affect political outcomes, especially when they're backed up by willingness to take political action. So large numbers of people taking political action change the political climate, but small numbers do not. They also manage to change the economic climate in some cases. If we think about direct action on climate change, for example, making it expensive to open new fossil fuel um, powered coal power stations affects the decision of power holders over whether they do that. But it looks like there aren't particular thresholds in any of these cases. It seems more like big changes in political opinion or number of people participating in these things make a different outcomes, but small numbers don't. So you might want to think about this as not being a threshold case, but being more like um, an insignificant, what I like to call an insignificant difference problem, which is known in the literature as an imperceptible difference problem. And I think imperceptible is appropriate here and we can use it because it's all about the perceptions of those who are making decisions. So we might think that one extra person joining climate camp and opposing a coal power station isn't going to make any difference to the decisions of energy companies moving forward. But we might think that a hundred more people or a thousand more people or some large indeterminate number being engaged in this action does change that decision. Similarly, we might think that large numbers being engaged in anti-war protests change a government's attitude to war going forwards and their ability to make airstrikes on new countries going forward. Um, we might think that that happened uh, in the UK following the war in Iraq when uh, airstrikes were proposed on Syria, it was much, was it Syria? Shit, um, was it? Anyway, the next set of airstrikes that were proposed were much harder to get through parliament. Okay, so we might think that what matters is big changes in public opinion and big changes in um, participation in political action and not small changes, such that the overriding question, what are the political outcomes? What are the political decisions being made by those with power? How, is, how are things organized, supervenes to some extent and has a relationship to the amount of, to public opinion and demonstrated public opinion through political actions and political organization. So for example, the level of trade union organization 
might affect the attitudes of employers and the decisions they make with regards to workers' rights. Where it's low, for example, they might sack 800 workers um, without consultation overnight, like they just did in the UK. Whereas where uh, trade unionism is incredibly active and people have um, are participating and aren't allowing these things to happen, we might think those decisions will be made differently. But we might think it's such that one person joining or not joining a trade union, coming out to strike, going to a picket line or not, has no effect whatsoever, but large changes in this underlying variable do. So we might think that this is um, an imperceptible difference problem in that whether or not one extra person joins the picket line is imperceptible, it's, it's not noticeable, and therefore it has no effect whatsoever on the decisions of power holders. Yet, large changes in the numbers of people who are active in unions have an effect on power holders. And this makes this a particularly tricky puzzle if we think that, um, if we think down to the individual level and we think about the decision of an individual whether to not to make the sacrifice to go out that day to take on costs when they could instead do other things that promote their good or the good of the community more generally. So if this is the right way to see the problem we've got an even trickier puzzle because it's not just that it's incredibly unlikely that we'll make a difference because we'll hit that threshold, it's that it's impossible for us to make a difference because our joining is imperceptible to those making decisions. It has no effect, of a significant effect because it's so gradual and yet big changes do. Now, whether or not these kinds of cases really do exist is actually controversial and quite interesting and there's a, a huge literature on this topic. So depending on how we see these problems, we need to tackle them differently. Okay. Right, so we've got this paradox and there are questions about how do we go about resolving this? So one way we could do it is that we can deny the paradox in certain ways. We can suggest that we can get around it without overcoming it to a certain extent. So one popular thing in the literature about this is just face it and say, well, actually, you, we're just being irrational here. We're not thinking about this properly. It, if it's a threshold problem, if there is a threshold whereby if we join in, we get a significant economic reform, and if we don't, we don't, we just don't know where it is. The fact that it's incredibly unlikely that we'll just hit that threshold but not pass it doesn't mean that we don't have a duty to go out, because actually, if we do the calculation, it makes such a huge difference to people's lives that even if it's incredibly, incredibly unlikely that we'll just hit that threshold and not go over or under, we still have reason to do it. So imagine a significant um, economic reform is, is agreed, say at the EU level, it's agreed um, that only clothing made um, with wages that reach a certain standard in local currencies in terms of goods that you can buy are permissible to be sold on the EU market, for example, this would make a huge difference to people's lives. And we might think that various petitions and political actions could push politicians towards making these decisions. And there might be a particular threshold at which it's passed where they say, fine, we'll pass it, there's enough public support, people are going to take this, they're going to accept the higher prices, this is going to work out, we, we need the political capital. Okay, in which case, because it makes such a huge difference, the very, very tiny chance of you being difference making is enough to get out there. Now there's a question of, does this work? Um, if it's an imperceptible difference problem of the kind that we just discussed, it's never going to work because it's never going to be one person or one additional person whereby it makes the difference, whereby it changes that swing representative and things come out differently in the political process, right? That's just never going to be the case. But if it is a genuine threshold problem, we might think that this tiny chance of us just hitting the threshold and just getting enough activists out is enough. Um, so I think this might be a potential solution in that case, but I think there's a reason why it doesn't, it doesn't, I don't think it's wholly satisfactory. And I think the reason why it isn't wholly satisfactory is because it doesn't tune with the reasons of activists on the ground, the way I understand it. When you go out and you support a demonstration, when you get involved in a petition, when you get involved in trade unionism, you don't think, the reason I'm doing this is because we might 
just be on the brink of making a breakthrough. And if I join, we will. And if I don't, we won't. And although that's incredibly tiny, I just can't take that risk. I'm, I'm going to go out and I'm going to do it. Right. I don't think that's how the reasoning works. I think people think that it's important for them to be a part of it. Um, and I think that it, this isn't entirely true to that reasoning. And I think if we can come up with an account that's a little bit more true to that reasoning, but validates it, that might be a better account. I know this is it's not, um, we might all just be incredibly irrational, but I think it's important that our reasoning to some extent reflects rational, reasonable reasoning on the ground. And so I think even if this played out as working, this tiny chance, so it's not an imperceptible difference problem, it's a threshold problem, we just don't know where the threshold is, and this tiny chance is enough to go out there, I don't think that's all there is. I think underlying our thought process here, there is something else, and there's something else that we might be able to reclaim, and I'm going to get to that later on in the presentation, but I just wanted to bring this out as an easy solution early on. What might bolster this conclusion is we might have underestimated how significant one individual joining is. So joining political movements, joining past movements, is usually not just a matter of turning out on the day or signing the petition or declaring yourself striking. It's usually more a matter of participating, organizing, evangelizing for a cause. So if we think on the one hand, just doing something can be quite influential if we do it publicly, but on the other hand, if we then go out and evangelize and try and get people more to do it, our influence by joining might actually be larger than we initially thought. And so this might increase what was a very, very tiny chance of making a difference. Because if imagine it's not just me who signs the position, petition because of my activism, a hundred extra people do, because I get 10 people and they each get 10 people, etc. It might look like this will play out better. So there is a question here that we might be able to avoid this paradox by saying, look, it's a very tiny chance, but it's going to work. It, um, uh, but but it's a very tiny chance. But if it works, it'll be hugely differential difference. And the chance isn't as tiny as you actually thought because of these spirals. OK, so if this works, I'm quite happy in some senses, because my as I said at the beginning, what I'm interested in is not coming up with a unique solution to a tricky moral puzzle. My main focus here is trying to see if we can validate these obligations to take political action. And if we can do that simply, that's great. I can move on in my project to tackle some other objections. But I think ultimately, this still does leave something to be desired. I think there are additional reasons to engage in political action that aren't just about this tiny chance of us meeting the threshold, but not exceeding it such that my action is difference making. And I actually think across a whole range of cases, this model of thinking that only what matters is difference making in moral philosophy is morally is, is problematic and requires reform. And this is just one example of it. OK, so another approach is we might think that we have other reasons to engage in political action that aren't actually about its impact on political outcomes. Now, I've got a range of these I'm going to look at. I'm going to do it quite briefly, because ultimately, I think that we do have a reason to engage in mass political action based on um, the outcomes that it promotes. So these, I think, add something to the account for taking political action. But I think there's more to it than that. OK, so we can do things like appeal to virtue. So if we look at um, Sadler's article and where he's talking about climate change, um, and why we shouldn't, for example, pollute too much or go on joy guzzling rides in the countryside, which is another literature that's quite useful for these kind of things. Uh, he says, well, let's just appeal to virtue ethics. That'll guess out the problem. I think there might be ways out in this direction, but I think that we still, I think that there are reasons beyond it's the virtuous thing to do. And I also think that he does need to explain why it's virtuous if it isn't because it has an effect on political outcomes or it contributes in some sense to political outcomes or it's our part in producing political outcomes of various kinds. Okay, another thing we can do is um, what Silverman suggests and appeals to well-being. So if you're one of the people being oppressed by an injustice, one big reason to take part in political action is to sort of reclaim your agency and your self-respect. If you don't stand up for yourself, you don't have a good life. This is the idea here. I think it's strong, I think it's powerful. But I think we also have reasons that are owed to other people, not just to ourselves, 
to engage in mass political action. I think this account is limited because it only um, is a reason that works for those who are currently being oppressed by this particular injustice, and it might be helpful to have allies beyond that. But I also think it suggests that it's just for you. Uh, it's just about duties to yourself. And actually, I think there are duties to others at play here. I think that's quite an appealing part of the idea of political action here. So this might help us out the problem, but I think it doesn't get to the heart of um, what I want, I want to show. Okay. Then there is the classic Bernard Williams from Utilitarianism and Beyond, um, appeal to integrity. It's this sort of internal value of being true to your values. Um, Williams has a lot of examples where he looks at these consequences versus integrity. And he, that's his way of framing the dilemmas that go on. So he might be able to use something similar. So Bernard Williams suggests that it is integrity that gives an individual against chemical warfare, a reason not to take a job manufacturing such weapons, even though if if she, he or she doesn't take the job, someone else will take their place um, and do it anyway. Um, so it's about acting with one's deepest uh, convictions. In a similar way, we might think it's hard to have integrity as somebody who supports um, uh, global justice if when the WTO meet in your city, you don't get out on the streets and, and join the campaign to encourage them to make the rules in a way that doesn't hugely disadvantage uh, the, the majority of the world. Okay, so we might appeal to integrity. It's about your underlying values. But again, I think what's happening here is, is powerful and important, but I think in addition to these integrity reasons, we do have duties that we owe to other people, duties that, that are at play here. So I think, can, I think we can do more than this. So in a way, I think these aren't the sort of reasons I'm looking for. I think that there's something that's owed to those currently suffering from injustice. Um, and it's about what's owed to them, not just about your own virtue, integrity, or well-being. Um, if not, I worry, especially when it comes across that you've got a choice between putting energy into these projects versus putting energy in projects that do actually help others who are owed a lot by us, uh, that it, these reasons are gonna be hard to stand up. But I think the main point is I do think that arguing for political mass political action on the basis of political outcomes is something worth saving. And I think these solutions just don't save it. Okay, so, um, and finally, I think this one has more power than the others because it is about what's owed to others rather than what you owe to yourself. So you might think that engaging in this kind of political action is important because of what it expresses to those who are suffering from injustice. So when somebody protests against the injustice that somebody else is suffering and expresses that they will prepared to make significant efforts working towards undermining it, right? What they do is express solidarity with those people and show respect for them in a way that I don't think can be achieved in other ways. So you might wanna put the dilemma, do I put my energy and my money and time into, for example, charitable donations to help those who suffer from injustice, or do I want to take part in political action aimed at stopping that injustice from continuing? And I think this is a difficult dilemma, and when the political version seems to be very unlikely to make a difference, it seems tempting to apply the aid. But what can that aid give you that this one, what can the political answer give you that the aid can't? And I think in terms of expression, the aid expresses concern for their well-being, but it can't express the kind of respect for their agency that supporting their rights through politics can. And I think there might be a strong reason. And I'd like to explore that further, but it's not my main focus today. But again, I think it's difficult because it's not actually rescuing political action for its, um, for its impact. It's saying you go out and you express something and in doing so, uh, you show respect to those who are suffering from injustice. But it doesn't say you have reason to do that because doing so is playing your part in um, promoting justice. And I think that's what I'm quite keen to recover, if we can. So my project is, can we recover this idea that's part of the paradox as I identified it at the beginning, which is we have reason to engage in mass political action based on contributing to making political outcomes better. Can that, can that be rescued? Okay, so, there are two accounts that I found quite plausible in rescuing that, and I'm going to talk about them today before I talk about 
how I think we can go on and, and make some decisions about how to think about these. Okay, so one option is perhaps we've just been thinking about causality wrong. We've been thinking about causality in terms of difference making, such that I should take the action and I'm if I take the action, I'm causally efficacious if it is true that but for me taking that action, some good consequences wouldn't have flowed or wouldn't have been instantiated, okay? And there's this idea of vectorial causality, which can get us over this, which instead of focusing on the difference I make between if I take the action and I don't take the action, the difference making, um, focuses on the what contribution do you make to the overall system that then determines the outcome. And this can capture some actions that aren't difference making. So. I'm drawing on a paper by Goldman about voting here. Again, I'm, I'm borrowing from the voting literature, but I thought it was useful and interesting. So the idea here is that taking part in political action or abstaining from taking part in political action when, does not, uh, when one does not make a difference to political outcomes can nonetheless involve causal responsibility for those outcomes. So a participator can make a partial causal contribution towards political change, even if she is not decisive. Those not taking action do not avert blameworthiness or culpability simply because their participating would not have been decisive in changing political outcomes. So we've got two things here. We can say that if you do take part in the mass action, you are contributing, and that matters in the moral calculus. And two, if you don't, you can be um, held accountable for that and you're doing something wrong. So if this works, it should give me what I wanted, which was we have a reason to take part, uh, based on contribution, and um, if we don't, we can be criticised. Okay. Um, so the idea is that potential actors should join social movements either to help produce good outcomes or to avoid bad ones, contra the paradox. So how does this work? What does this look like? So he thinks that we can differentiate partial responsibilities for outcomes. So even if we're not decisive, we can be a partial cause of a victory. So a collector can earn moral or quasi-moral credit for the political outcome, even when they're not decisive. So this looks quite appealing. So we've got this idea of victorial causality. So um, in my lectures, when I discuss this, there is this idea of a tug of war is a good way of envisioning it. You've got these different political forces pulling in different directions that result in political outcomes. And the question is, which way are you pulling? And so, so they're contributing, resisting and neutral factors with regards to any particular result. And what matters is which you were with regards to good or bad results. We are morally responsible for our contributions to the outcomes, regardless of whether it's decisive or not. And what this means is you don't have to be difference making in order to have some moral credit here or for, in order for it to matter what you're doing. So this looks like quite powerful and appealing. So this translates into responsibility in this way. So suppose person Z votes for candidate C, but C loses nonetheless. Is Z in any way responsible for C's defeat? No, Z did everything in his electoral power to elect C, so he cannot be held responsible. So similarly, somebody shows up an anti-war protest. Are they responsible for the fact that war goes ahead anyway? No, they did everything they could to stop it. Okay. Now suppose that Z abstains. They don't turn up. Um, can be certain, um, is he responsible um, for the loss? Uh, because there was an option available that they could have taken that counteracts and pushes in the other direction, yet they didn't. So it looks like abstention is, it's not pulling in the negative direction, but it's not doing everything it can to push in the positive direction. So this looks like an attractive model if we find it plausible that what matters isn't just the difference you make, but the direction you pull in. And it, it's, quite, it's quite nicely put. And we might want to attach blame to this as well. Okay, you're blameworthy for what you do. I think this is more controversial. I think the one where you get out of blame for doing everything you could, even though it didn't work, is, is much more attractive than the one where you get blamed for, for not doing it. But this, this is interesting, but it's not quite what I'm talking about today. Okay, so, do we want to adopt this model? Is this the right way to think about um, causality for moral purposes? Okay, now causality is a huge, huge topic. Causal responsibility and moral responsibility are related to each other. Um, I'm very happy to talk about this in the discussion more. Um, there are various ways of understanding the relationship between those two. Okay, so will there be problematic consequences of adopting this understanding of causal responsibility? Um, I think that the main challenge here is that if we think about what 
do we put into the political battle rather than what difference do we to make? There is a worry that we're gonna end up recommending people join fights where it doesn't really make sense for them to do so. So we might think that if enough people are already participating in a scheme to make it work and you're joining the scheme or the action isn't actually going to make anything better, you're just going to claim the moral credit, we've got a problematic moral credit system, right? So the example um, that's used by Parfit against this way of understanding things, it's, he uses it against the share of responsibility model, but I think it can be used against here, is imagine you have a cart full um, of water that's going to be driven out to the desert and given to a bunch of thirsty people. It's a huge cart, there's loads of people, we've all got our bottles of water, we can tip them in. I get there and I see that it's already full, but I tip my bottle in because I wanna show that I was part of the effort. This seems stupid. And similarly, it seems stupid for me to barrel in on a political cause that I already know is, is going to work out. It seems much more sensible for me to put my energies elsewhere. So I think a worry about vectoral responsibility that the account needs to um, deal with is how do we make sure that we don't end up make, we, we don't end up encouraging people to do things where there is no sense in them doing it. Now, I think that our accounts here need to cover not just this case of imperceptible difference or threshold problem. I think they've also got to cover some other cases. So cases where we know that um, political action isn't going to succeed, um, but there isn't any political action that will, do we have an obligation to play our part, right? And I think in that case, there can be a reason. Whereas I think in the case where um, the political action is going to work without us, it's better for us to put our energies elsewhere unless we can reduce the burdens on others. So I think we need an account of moral credit here and responsibility, um, ultimately, because the two are related to each other, that's going to give us the right answers across a range of cases and not convinced that vectoral responsibility is always going to do that. Okay, so um, I'm conscious of the time, but I think we started ever so slightly. Yes, Let's... that's fine. It's fine. Cool. Okay, so I want to talk about what I think is the most plausible model for understanding the reasons that are going on here. And to do it, I'm going to draw on Christopher Woodard's work on reasons, patterns, and cooperation. So Woodard introduces um, something he calls pattern-based reasons or group-based reasons. Um, to explain some of the intuitions we have about tricky moral cases in which our instincts towards pragmatism and doing what will make the best consequences given the situation as we can predict it come in conflict with more principled reasons where we want to do our part in a pattern of action that would be good even if we think others aren't going to play that part so even if the willingness requirement um, isn't fulfilled. So I'm going to explain a little bit more about this. But what I think is the pattern-based reasons can help us through a number of these dilemmas where principle and pragmatism come apart. And I think that's what's happening in these cases of the voting paradox. We have the principled idea that we should be um, engaging in mass political action, but we have this pragmatic idea that actually we're not going to make any difference. And I think pattern-based reasons can explain the push towards taking action um, without leading us places that we don't want to go. And I think that they might be part of the solution and they're going to be part of what I think we should think about this going forward and, and, and my next work on this. Okay, so what's going on here? Pattern-based reasons is the idea that sometimes we have a moral reason to perform an action because it is part of a larger pattern of action that we have reason to favour. So it's not the action itself and its effects that give us reason to morally recommend it. It's the fact that that action is part of a larger set, a larger pattern or scheme that we have reason to favor. So we can think about this in a number of ways. So one is on a, on a personal case, we might think that me going for a jog today isn't significant to my health, but if that jog is part of a regime of exercise that's gonna take me up for the next 30 years of my life, we might think that it is gonna have a significant impact on my health, right? Similarly, we might think that my performing um, some part in some collective action, um, for example, um, engaging in recycling, isn't going to make a big difference, but as a pattern of action, it does make a difference and got a reason to favor that whole pattern. 
And there are various cases of this kind. And I think pattern-based reason is a good way of modeling them. So it's about the qualities of that pattern, both its effects and what it can instantiate, because I don't want it to have to all be outcome-based, that give us reason to endorse it. And I think when we think people should engage in mass political action, it's because of that pattern of action of the full mass political action having a particular value. Now, of course, there are tricky puzzles still to get regarding when we have a pattern-based reason to perform our part in a pattern, which pattern, um, and how this comes up against other reasons, which give you a direct reason. So I don't think this solves the problem on its own, but I think it gives us a tool for understanding what goes on when we push in a particular direction on this and other cases, that's gonna be part of our toolkit for working out what are the moral reasons in play here, okay? So I think that this, this account can help us here and I think it can help us in some other tricky cases regarding mass political actions. Okay. So Woodard's discussion of this reason supports them by showing how they can explain our intuitions in cases where principle and pragmatism come apart, okay? And he thinks what's happening here is often that there's a pattern of action we support, but we know others aren't going to play that part. Now, he draws on some of Bernard Williams' examples, where Bernard Williams uses the account of integrity in order to support his pattern-based reasons. I don't have time to go into many of them today, but the basic idea here is, um, in the case I already talked about with the person possibly going to work um, to make chemical weapons, what you need to ask yourself is, is there, is there a pattern based reason here to refrain from engaging in that work? Well, if we think that morally what's required is a monitorium on that kind of work and that everybody should be refusing to take part in that work, if we think that's what would produce a morally good outcome, i.e. we don't develop more chemical weapons, then we might say that the person offered the job has a pattern-based reason not to take the job, even if it doesn't change the amount of those weapons actually produced. And what's the advantage here is it's not about that person's integrity, it's not about them, it's about what they owe to others. And what they owe to others is doing their part in a pattern that would have good results. And the, the difficult part here is, I think everyone accepts pattern-based reasons when we know other people stand willing to play their part. But the idea that Woodard suggests is that we still think that there is some reason, and he doesn't think it's decisive, by the way, um, that pushes us, that says, look, we should still do our part in the, in the better pattern, for that sense. And I think in the same way, we might think we should still do our part in the better pattern of mass political action because it's part of a pattern-based reason. And the advantage of this approach is then we can weigh it against and we can think about it in context and bring together different reasons that might push in different directions. And we can come up with a way of understanding how to treat these different cases that is consistent. Okay, and that's what I wanna recommend for the next stage of my project. So acknowledging pattern-based reasons reflects the idea that each individual responsibility is to play their part in a scheme that will overall lead to justice rather than working individually um, to make a difference. So I think this is powerful because it reflects the reasons that activists often have when they are actually on the ground. If you ask somebody why are you here that at a protest, they often say that this protest is important for affecting political outcomes and this is my part in that. Okay. There's still difficult questions to answer about when it makes sense to take up a part and when it doesn't. And I think this might still present difficulties if we accept something like the imperceptible difference model. If we accept the threshold model, I think it's gonna work much better because we can say there are these parts and these parts come together in order to produce this outcome and I'm playing my part. The fact that other people aren't here playing their part doesn't necessarily um, change the fact that I have reason to be here. And so I think it can be very powerful in those cases where we think we're not gonna hit the threshold. The question is, is it still powerful um, in cases of imperceptible difference? Okay. So we might want to challenge this account by asking questions that need to be answered if it's going to be applied. So how do we determine which pattern of action to play our part in? Often there are multiple patterns that would produce the consequences that we think are morally required. We also need to ask what makes question, action qualify as part of a pattern. Can we just add random actions? Can I say that me standing in my room um, uh, taking some meaningless political gesture um, is part of a pattern that brings about global justice. 
we don't want to be able to just add actions randomly or based on intention. So I think we're going to need something like um, nest conditions here. Is it a necessary part of a sufficient set to produce the outcome? Okay. Um, um, and how do we balance pattern based reasons against pragmatic reasons? So if I think that my, my um, uh, participation in a mass political movement is going to be insignificant, but I can do a lot of good for identifier people at home. We're going to have a classic dilemma that we can look at. Um, there's a famous one, I think, about should you go and support the Spanish Civil War or look after your aging mother uh, that's of this form. So I think it's not going to tell us necessarily what the right answer is in an easy way. What I think this is doing is giving us a way to model the conflict to understand the conflict that's true to the reasoning that we're doing on the ground. And then we're going to need further analysis in order to work out what to do in which cases and why. So, um, yeah, I think it's good at explaining the intuition towards taking part, um, but I don't think it's gonna fully resolve it. So in my last few minutes, because I think I'm out of time, um, I'm gonna talk about how I think it might make sense to go forward in this project. So. I think pan-based reasons offer something intuitively powerful here, but it doesn't resolve the conflict. It just gives us a way to understand the conflict and understand why we have the conflict. On the one hand, we have a pantheon-based reason that says that we should participate. On the other hand, we have a difference-making reason that suggests that it's, it's pointless and there is a conflict here and that we should do something else. Okay. So how can we make our way through? Well, I think in the background, we need to have an understanding about what we're doing when we're doing moral reasoning. And I think when we're moral reasoning, we're justifying our choices and behavior to others, and we're holding each other to shared standards of conduct. That means that we have to be consistent and we have to treat like cases the same. So I think with regards to this, we need to come up with a way of coming up with some principles and rules for understanding how to judge these cases, but these tools also need to help us judge other kinds of cases as well and get the right answers on those. So I think I'm gonna end up recommending something quite classic from analytical moral philosophy, which is looking at what we think is needed for the right kind of answer, coming up with some principles and then testing them against various cases. So I think what we want is to ensure that vital, vital collective goods like justice can be secured. I think if our moral theory leaves it the case that there's injustice and that's just fine, we can all go about our lives, something's wrong with our moral theory. What we don't want though, is a moral theory that tells me to get out there and do all sorts of actions that make no difference in the world. Um, to pour the water into a cart that's already fully full and then just to show that I was there, I was a good citizen. Um, so I think we need a clever, we need a nuanced approach here and I think um, what we're going to need to do is look at various complex cases and refine things. Luckily, some of this work has already been done on the abstract level. And that's what I'm going to be looking into a little bit more next. OK, so I think what we need to do is propose general rules for assessing cases and test them against different examples and come up with a set of reasons that require individuals to contribute to collective benefit cases where their action in combination with those of others will make a difference without requiring them to make pointless contributions in cases where thresholds have already been met even without their contribution. Um, of course, there's gonna be some debate about um, which set of duties and reasons and principles is the best and why, and I think we're gonna have some reasonable disagreements about that, but I think that that's the sensible way forward here. Okay, so to recap, what have I talked about today? I've talked about how well I think there's a genuine um, paradox here between the intuition that mass political movements are required for social justice and because they're made up of lots of individuals that gives us a reason um, to want to engage with them and yet on the other hand there's a strong idea that we shouldn't waste our time if we can't make a difference. I've suggested that we might want to model this as a threshold problem or we might want to model it as an insignificant, um, um, an imperceptible difference case. Uh, I've suggested that there are various schemes that give us other kinds of reason, but I find them unsatisfactory because they don't ultimately give us a reason based on um, contributing to mass movements that they can then affect political outcomes. 
I've suggested that pattern-based reasons might give a good way of understanding what's going on here. The idea that we can have moral reason to take an action, not because of the action itself or the effects, of, likely effects of the action itself in our world, but instead based on the value of a pattern of action of which the action is part. And I'm hoping that this can be part of a system of rules and principles for governing our behavior that can explain and justify um, the need to join mass political movements without requiring people to make pointless sacrifices of various kinds in other examples. Um, um, thanks for your attention. I'm going to leave it there and, and go over to questions. Great, thank you very much. Um, okay, so if you can unshare your screen so we can see everybody. Sorry, I'm just working out how that's done. Um, where, where you had the share screen thing, it should be possible to unshare it, whatever button that is somewhere. Aha! No, that's trying, now I'm trying to share something else. Ah, ha, ha, ha! There you go. There you okay, go. very, very interesting, really well done. Uh, so, um, we will take uh, questions. So, um, okay. I see two, three, great. Aaron, let's start with Aaron Brown. Oh my. Um, okay, well, uh, first, thank you. I, I have to say this morning I was feeling just generally not particularly intellectually inspired and now you've got me firing on all cylinders. So, um, so that, I appreciate that. Um, I guess my, my question, very general question, and I, I suspect it's one you've considered, um, I guess I'm wondering, what are your thoughts about that aspect of, you know, you talk about uh, justification, right, for others. Um, what are your thoughts about that aspect for uh, justification to others? Uh, that is a justification because it is to particular others. That is that it's specific to our existing view about the value of those relationships. So, you know, you, you brought up the example of, you know, certainly there are times where I'm at the mass action. If somebody were to ask me, why are you here? I mean, the reason I care is because, yes, there's maybe district difference making reasons, pattern reasons, but the reason why I'm actually show, I actually showed up today as opposed to this event over here was because a particular person asked me to. And perhaps that that particular person had certain qualities or I viewed the, right? And these are what like in the, for example, in the literature on trade unionism, the people who are good at this are what get labeled, you know, organic leaders, which I think for me also raises to a larger point is, is, is that, are, you know, is it possible that we're dealing with multiple rationalities based on, um, on the uh, extent of one's existing commitment? to the large action um, in question, um, especially because sometimes, at least in the literature on organic leaders and trade unionism, there's this sense that actually the best leaders are not the ones that want to talk to the, to the union activists first. They're the ones that kind of want to stay behind and, uh, and, and, and wait to see uh, how things go, and that is, in, Part, at least that's what the what the the implication seems to be why others trust them right trust that they wouldn't just ask them to do something that would be pointless or backlash or refuse risk um, in the end that just being one example not necessarily a case for all examples of where right where the social aspect of of being asked and showing up is a, a crucial part of, of your reasoning um, so I'm just wondering generally how are you how are you considering that 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 factor? Great. Um thank you very much. Um so I I I feel like you inspired several different thoughts. Um so I I I'm not sure whether these will precisely answer your question, but well to be fair, I, I kind of asked multiple questions. So so 
I think there is a strict understanding of morality whereby we don't draw on personal connections or valuable relationships. We don't draw on the things that motivate us or make our life good. I think I see that in the sort of effective altruism critique of any kind of charity that you have a personal connection with over just maximizing utility. And I think that's too, too strict to morality in terms of trying to make everybody do the optimal thing rather than saying, look, we, we owe people certain things. And, and within that, you should pursue your own ethical path based on the things that you happen to value and, and that you want to do with your life and the connections that you build. So that's one thought on it. Um, another thought on it is one reason you might want to attend a protest or join in union activities might be the social aspect. It might be being part of a community and, and feeling good in various ways and enjoying various personal relationships. And I think that's not negative. I think that's great. I think that might give us another reason. If we think back to integrity, right? If we think back to well-being, I think this could be part of that story. And I think it adds grist to the case for taking part in political action. But I think we still need that core of we're doing this in order to help others, um, in order to be part of a political movement that's going to bring about justice. So not just help them, but make sure that what they're owed is actually there, make sure that they're not continuing to be oppressed. I think that's absolutely key. Finally, I think talking about organic leaders, what was missing in my original abstract about this talk was this idea that, well, we need mass political movement, but nobody is particularly influential. The truth is some people are incredibly influential and are influencers and other people aren't, right? That's the truth here. And there is this question of, if you are one of these people who has the ability to be an organic leader, is there an extra demand on you because you can actually be difference making? I'm quite worried about because you can, you must kind of arguments in general in moral philosophy. I think they use much too keenly because they undermine fairness. Just because you happen to be in a particular situation or just because you happen to have particular qualities, it seems a shame that you should be burdened more than others, but then maybe you're burdened in this way and they can be burdened in another way and it will work out. Um, but I think my question today was, what if you're not one of those organic leaders, you're just a sort of run of the mill person, do you have any reason to turn up? And I think we're in trouble if you don't, because if you don't have reason to turn up um, and we just get the organic leaders there, that's a problem. I guess one model is the organic leaders have a reason to organize and then those who show up have a reason because of their personal connection with them, with their charisma or whatever, and that, that could get us there. But I find that a little bit um, unsatisfactory in some ways. I think the run of the mill people have a reason to be there too, and it's not just because they want to see their charismatic leader. Now that you say that, I think, I think that maybe I think what I was intuitively kind of picking up on was the sense that that maybe that right that that kind of uh, 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 scheme of justification that fits to the, the kind of pure version, as you put it, of morality that you were describing, that it's something that might actually appeal more to what we've been talking about as organic leaders. At least that would be my worry. That would be my fear. Um, but that only justifies your project, because it seems that, that your project is to, is, to, is to show that that does not have to be the case. Okay. We have several uh, questioners. I'm going to just continue a little bit with students and um, call on Callum and then Alex, and then we'll move to Virginia and Tran and Patty Lee. Okay. Callum? Unmute. Thanks. Yeah. Sorry, finding the button. Um, thanks so much for the for the talk. I thought it was really uh, great. Um, I had a, a couple of questions, both about sort of your solution, um, the pattern based uh, solution at, at the end. So one quick one is just I had some worries about the language you were using to describe it, I, I think the quote, it was a few slides from the end, was that it involves making a relevant contribution to uh, an organization that makes a genuine impact or something like that. I'm just worried that the, like one might think that a relevant contribution is a contribution that makes an impact. <laughs> and if that's the case, then um, then we're, we're stuck with the same sort of problem to begin with. So I was worried that some of the language was making this 
get off the hook too easily, so to speak. We have to sort of make sure that relevant contribution is contribution other than one that makes an impact. Um, and then my second question was about sort of your criticisms of some of the some of the solutions that you consider and reject. Um, and I thought that some of them might have more uh, sort of mileage in them than, than you uh, gave them credit for. In particular, the respect one. Um, so the thought was, if all the, 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 if the grounds for your reason to join up is just that it's sort of respectful, um, there isn't a robust enough tie to whether or not it's actually making a concrete difference. And we want the justification to have a more robust tie, or at least that's, that's as I understood it. Um, but it seems like, say that there are three organizations I can join. One of them is really effective. One of them is moderately so. One of them is useless. It's just hopelessly run. It's much more respectful for the people that these uh, institutions are designed to help if I go for the really effective one. And in fact, it's kind of disrespectful if I just go along to the one that's hopeless and it doesn't work and doesn't have an impact. Um, and if there is that sort of tie, then it seemed like respect reasons could actually help your patent-based model quite a bit. Why do we have these reasons to make contributions to patents that are effective? Well, because doing that is respectful to the people who, who are, uh, are on the receiving end of the contributions. So maybe the integrity thing, you could run something the same, like it's only gonna avoid doing harm to my integrity if I'm helping an organization that actually makes a difference, because if not for similar sorts of reasons, but I think the respect one's probably stronger. Um, brilliant, um, brilliant questions. Um, so uh, uh, the second one, my response is a bit easier. Um, thank you, that's great. So uh, the chapter that the paper came out of was originally basically like a five dog defense you know, the, the classic one, my dog, my dog didn't buy you, that's not my dog, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I was just trying to like bring as much as I could, like, we should do this, boom. We haven't got reason not to do this, okay? And in the transfer, I, I think it's, it's come across as, no, these ones are not gonna work, so we need to go over here. And I think that structure is not necessarily fair and I don't think I've, I've, I've really dismissed these other ways. Um, and I'm not sure I, I want to ultimately. Um, I really liked when you put the two together because I hadn't actually thought about how they could be tied together. I, I recently thought about this respect one. I'm sure somebody else has done it in the literature somewhere, but I, I, my initial draft of this said, oh, look, if we want to show respect, then aid shows respect as well. But then I was watching a documentary about disability rights activists and I was like, they start, um, uh, running into a telethon to aid the disabled and like smashing it up like screw this piss on pity and I thought yeah they, they kind of have a point here giving to charity does not express the respect that opposing global injustice does it really doesn't and and that inspired me to say look I think there is there is mileage in this respect showing a reason to go the political route um, I really liked how you tied the two together yeah in order to show respect, I can't just do something meaningless. I have to do something effective if I got the chance to. But I think I still show the respect, even if the effective version is, is not gonna work. So I have two chapters. One chapter deals with inconsequentialism and this one that I've brought here. And the one that actually I think is more interesting and important to some extent, I've got more to say on, is the one about, should I join a political movement even if I think not enough people are going to? And I think there, this is, this is gonna play out really nicely. So in response to that, I wanna say thank you. I think that's good. And I think integrity might tie in as well. Yeah, you need to be, I think I was worried about integrity because then there's a dismissal from people from the more consequentialist side of things saying, well, this is all about you. It's not really about other people. Um, but they might ultimately come together. Um, I think there's a route to go down. If we think about Christine Korsgaard and morality and how morality is actually about being true to yourself ultimately. But I've always thought about that as being too internal, not external enough. I'm more into this, the right to justification, kind of what we owe to each other stuff. But it might be interesting if they can come together at heart, that would be a really exciting product because I'm really interested in how ethics and duties to self go with morality and justification to others. Anyway, the other question was more challenging 
And I think you're right. Got to be really careful about the language around pattern based reasons. It wasn't thought out enough in this account and I need to do more. Um, so uh, I said relevant contribution to a movement that has genuine impact. Does that just mean being difference making? Right. I don't think it does. And I, here's why. I think I can do something a bit like nest conditions. So in my paper that works on when are we contributing to harm, that's aggregative, rather than when are we contributing to benefit, I ended up appealing to an idea that turned out to be extensionally equivalent with nest, which is, is something a necessary element of a sufficient set to produce an outcome? I did it slightly differently, but it works out the same. And so the idea here was, it's, you've got pattern based reason, the necessary element is your part in the pattern, right? The sufficient set is the whole pattern. So the whole pattern has to be sufficient to alleviate the injustice. And yours has to be a necessary part of that in order for that to have a quality. Now that doesn't mean that there aren't any other sufficient sets or that you couldn't drop out and somebody else could take your place. I find Ness a bit confusing. So the way I understand it is, is it true that, but for the whole pattern, the good outcome wouldn't be, wouldn't occur? And is it true that, but for your contribution, if you fell out, dropped out and nobody replaced you, that it wouldn't have that quality? And I think it's a good way of capturing when you're, you're pushing in the right direction in a way um, that might um, explain when we're causally relevant without being difference. Yeah, it has to be that you're difference making, but you're right, it needs more work and I need to be careful about what I plug in there. But um, thanks, that's super helpful. Okay, so we'll turn to Alex and then Virginia. Hi, um, thanks, thanks so much for this. This is really, re really fascinating. Give me a lot to think about. I've got a bunch of questions. I'm going to try and combine two of them and let other people have turns. So what I'm wondering about is uncertainty and the long duration. Something that I thought that I think of as relevant when I consider whether or not to do to, to join in any kind of direct action or to try and encourage others to do so is that there's no way to know how big of a group is needed. We might know it's a big group. And there's also no way to know, you know, until you're like a professional organizer, there's really no way to know whether or not you're one of those people with an outsized impact. Um, there's no way to know whether or not you might be in a particular context, even if you've never been before, or whether or not you might have this spiral effect and I'm inclined to think that these, um, all of these little uncertainties uh, might add up quite a bit and, and give us reason to take that chance to do our bit. And then the other part of it is, um, I also think of myself when, when, when thinking about injustice and what I can do is maybe this won't get solved now. Maybe this is something that's going to take decades or generations I, I and when i think about the the people who went before me the fact that they did stuff that didn't work but laid the groundwork for things that are working now or could work in the future um it, it's it's clear that those were really important even if even if the results were extremely long term um yeah so i'm wondering how uncertainty and, and long duration might factor into this. Um, brilliant, yeah, thank you very much. So um, I think considering the knowledge situation is incredibly important here. And I think there's too much modeling of, we know this or we know that when the truth is that we're in this epistemic situation of immense uncertainty. What that means for whether we should or shouldn't act, I'm unsure and I think it's something that I need to be a bit humble about. There's a lot of people who are working on epistemic questions at the moment. And I think I need to delve deeply into that literature to think about these questions a bit more. Um, because in the absence of knowledge, does that speak in favor of action just in case or not action because you don't know? It's unclear to me whether that helps or hinders, or, or but you know, um, so I think that's quite interesting. And I think it's quite relevant and important here. 
um, the long span of justice and how you have all these different things. When you look at the, few, the history of social movements, that is actually how it works. You might not achieve a particular outcome that you were aiming for and you're working for then, but it's about whether you influence the long-term political climate and how things change. And the uncertainty around that is even huger, but that is the hope of activists, isn't it? The hope of activists is that they're part of this and that that's what they're gonna do. But that makes it even less certain, which I think might sort of undermine your reason so again, I don't know whether these epistemic issues push in favor of doing it or in not doing it. And perhaps I, I think I need to be more open to the, uh, the idea that perhaps we shouldn't be doing this. Perhaps we should all be nihilists and just give up. But um, no, I think I don't think that's, that. that's definitely not what Alex is recommending. <laughs> but um, yeah, we need to, um, in, in some drafts of this, there is this question of, yeah, we need to think about the long term, not the short term. We need to think about these things. So I think that's good. But yeah, I, I think what I'm going to take from that is we need to look about how the immense uncertainty in these circumstances should influence our decision making and our moral reasoning. And if anyone has references on that, I will happily take them. I don't have a reference, but I have a, a very quick follow up. Sometimes we can be quite certain that doing nothing is is effectively pulling on a status quo we don't believe in and so sometimes it's a difference between uncertainty that will make things better and total certainty that we're contributing to the problem and that that sometimes simplifies what what we should do i think but yeah sometimes sometimes the uncertainty is really great and that's 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 the case i mean it's the classic you can't be neutral on a moving train right the how Zinn talks about that a lot um but I and I am quite committed to that and, and a big part of the book is showing how we are um engaged in these structural injustices and how we will contribute to them in the future unless we do something that's why it's this idea of precaution that all of this action is about precaution to avoid future harm that that's like the, the model that that gets us going um I think what my more nihilistic and pessimistic um colleagues who I've worked with over the years would suggest is you're not sure that the mass political movement that you set off might not actually do much much more harm than just leaving the horribleness that we endure currently you know you you might be producing another horrendous political movement that does terrible things I'm not convinced by these people but it, it is an argument nah. uh, Virginia uh, I'm not sure that I'm I'm um, unmuted in the right way. Oh, we hear you. We hear you. Everything's okay, good. fine. Well, I want to start by congratulating Elizabeth. I thought that was a, a really excellent discussion, very excellent discussion of a very uh, important set of problems. And um, one of the things that I, I think that we can um, uh, conclude from your discussion is that Utilitarian reasoning and moral argument is not sufficient and it will not be adequate for dealing with these kinds of problems. But on, on the other hand, neither um, would purely deontological arguments be satisfactory for the kinds of reasons that you brought up of, of whether the, whether the uh, action you take is, is um, completely pointless. Um, and um, it leads me to think that you might consider um, the alternative of the ethics of care for a lot of the problems that you're most interested in. These problems that you're labeling um, injustice um, could also be interpreted in other ways. And the ethics of care asks us to be guided by the values of care um, one of the most important of which is responding to need. And when you're thinking of a lot of the um, problems you're addressing, like uh, global poverty or environmental um, um, disaster uh, and the kinds of political actions that we need to take uh, to address these, these problems and issues, care the ethics of care would recommend that we be guided by the values of care and extend them from our more immediate surroundings to um, the wider ones and, and uh, uh, into the global context. And um, primary among the values of care are responding to need. 
which would cover quite a few of the sort of problems that you're addressing. And care asks, the, the ethics of care asks us to respond to needs uh, with empathy and to develop the kinds of um, sensitivity that would lead us to do it effectively and um, appropriately rather than um, um, imposing our values on others. So um, I just think that you, you might um, want to consider um, that some of the problems that you're talking about are not primarily um, problems of injustice, but are problems of failures of um, care on a wider scale. Thank you very much. That's, that's very, very kind. Um, sometimes you feel like your work doesn't make sense or that you're not, you're not doing very well. So it's very nice when people are complimentary, especially people whose work you're hugely influenced by and really like. So that's nice. Um, so uh, I, think, I think you're right. A utilitarian response to this on its own is going to fail. And I think a purely deontological one is going to fail as well because it they both lead to conclusions that are just intuitively so uh, horrendous. And I think what I'm trying to do is try and create a model in which we can bring about, we can use deontological reasons and utilitarian reasons, and we can think about how they should come together to come up with a general screen for consistently talking about how we need to treat each other. I hadn't looked at the ethics of care. I haven't engaged with it greatly. Um, I think I should to find out whether there is an answer there that can help me. I think what's put me off is perhaps a, a misunderstanding of how care works. I think when I think about care, I think about responding to need. And when I think about needs, I think about, um, I don't think, so I, I think on one hand, I think about care and need and concern in this sort of very personal, direct, loving, but perhaps overbearing and deciding for. I'm quite worried about that. And I think I think this this isn't what care ethics is about. But I think the reason why values like justice are are important to me are, are, are related to the reason why I want to reject the aid model for poverty, because I think it's really important that people have rights and they have power and they can choose themselves and they're not dependent on others and that they can make mistakes and that they can take care of themselves and that they don't I know we all need to take care of each other to some extent but I, I, I think I associate care with a sort of stifling us and I think maybe that's a problem I think I, I think I need to look into that more and whether it has to be like that or whether there can be a notion of care that gives people space autonomy power and control and that can work on a mass scale because I think that's the other problem with with care I, I understand how it works on a direct relationship, but I don't know how it can work indirectly. Can there be a, a caring state or a caring politics? Can I respond? Do we have sure. time? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, well, um, since the very early uh, discussions of care, a whole lot has been written to counter and show why the ethics of care would not have the sort of limitations you're talking about. For instance, the... the um, um, idea of care as you impose something on, the, the mother imposes something on the child, for instance. Um, care requires sensitivity uh, to the perspective of the other just as much as one's own perspective. And um, um, care has to be considered just as much from the point of view of the recipient as of the person providing the care. So you have to constantly uh, consider care from the perspective of the people receiving it. So in the case of global poverty, the people receiving um, aid or whatever, um, their perspective is just as important as the perspective of the people providing it. And the idea that care is limited to close uh, personal relations or the family um, is, is very much a, a, a factor of um, the original thinking about the ethics of care, but it has developed a great deal since then and is no longer by any means limited to personal um, pro provisions of care. Okay, we do have a lot of questions. So um, let's move to Ashant and then Patty Lee and then Hugo, and then I wanna say ask you some things. 
Yeah, thanks. I agree with everyone. Um, really interesting talk and, and lots of food for thought. I guess I had a, a methodological question. Um, I didn't catch like a lot of you know specific examples of, of protests at a local level or a global level. So it just made me wonder how important is it to you or, or how much should your kind of this theoretical work going on be informed by real world examples of which there's an endless and growing number? I mean, or is, is, do you think there's good empirical data out there that can help us because I my gut you know I guess where I'm coming from is my my gut feeling is that um, we we would have a lot to learn about you know the effectiveness of an individual role in protest and that there is a kind of scale um, you know starting from the hyper local level to a global level so anyway, yeah method how much how much should we be thinking of real world examples here. That's a really exciting question for me. I, I really, really am quite committed now to this idea that we need to write philosophy that's useful to people and we need to engage with the actual reasoning that they have, not because it's necessarily right, but because it's useful and it might reveal something that we've missed. We have a very particular perspective, the kind of people who engage in, in what we do because of the lives that we live, but also because of the lack of diversity that we have in a huge way. Um, both in the lives that we live but also in our backgrounds and I think talking to people and finding out their reasoning on the ground and engaging empirically that way is really exciting and it's something I want to do more especially in this project and thinking about the reasoning of activists and people who are not activists in terms of why um, and whether there are good arguments there. Um, empirical data I, I'm quite drawn to I think I need to read a lot more of the empirical literature on change how political change occurs um, I've been, I can see that in Elizabeth Anderson's work uh, in looking at the history of change and looking particularly about um, civil rights in the US and, and the end of slavery and stuff is really fascinating. And I think those of us who want to apply philosophy to the real world have an obligation to engage with the literature. And I think as part of this project, I'm going to, so this is where I want my work to go next, basically, and I want to read up on the social science literature of various kinds. I don't think it's just about the data, because I think the data are on its own, which data and how, it's not going to make right. sense to me. And I'm quite worried about an overly um, quantitative data approach, but I really want to find out more about this. And, and so, yeah, I'm really excited about these prospects. Okay. Yeah, that sounds great. Thank you. Patty. Hi. Uh, a couple of real world examples. Um, that I've been thinking about lately because I keep getting asked, why do you bother? Um, one is mask wearing during the pandemic and the other one is cleaning up your dog shit. Um, in both cases, my answer that I have come to when I'm found that I have to justify my, why am I bothering is uh, I call it modeling behavior. Uh, in other words, what you do may catch on when other people see you doing it. Uh, showing up to a demonstration, obviously the same thing. Uh, that it becomes hip to do it if people are seen doing it and they seem to be like totally normal people. You know? <laughs> um, and if you um, do not do these things, then your failure to do them is also modeling behavior. You know? So modeling behavior is a multiplier effect. So it's not that the one person shows up, namely you, and does the right thing or comes to the demonstration. It's that you multiply the effect by other people seeing you doing it and thinking, oh, okay, that's a hip thing to do. Or now I, I, you know, I've thought about it and I understand why the person's doing it and so on. Um, so uh, so, so I, I just think um, being a model for other people Silently, not like making a big lecture about it, but just like it seems like a normal thing to do because you're doing it, and so maybe other people will do it, is, is also a factor in not just meeting the threshold, but in hoping that you know each person who models behavior will bring two or three others. You know? um, so you get well past the threshold. Uh, the other thing I just wanted to mention was the categorical imperative. You know, <laughs> classical education. Uh, the, the categorical imperative, um, thanks to Kant, uh, basically says just behave in such a way that your actions could be a universal law, that everybody would do it. Just like your mom used to say, you know, don't throw that out the car window, what if everybody did it? Um, that can have a positive aspect too. So it's, it's kind of the same thing as modeling behavior.
It's like, do what you think everybody should do, and maybe they will see you doing it, and they'll do it too, even if you don't get in a big moral argument with them. Thank you. So, yeah, that's really helpful and really interesting, and I recommend wearing a mask whilst cleaning up the dog shit is doubly <laughs> powerful. Um, uh, yeah, um, I think it's really true. And so I recently read um, Lisa Hertog's book about um, organizations and firms and what goes on in that, and it just blew me away. And one big section of that um, was about how in moral philosophy, it'd be really helpful to stop thinking about person in scenario A, what should you do in that scenario? And to start thinking about what kind of scaffolding and structure can we help to create so that when we are in the scenario, it's easy for us to do the right thing. Because actually it's very, it, we are very, very influenced by this, the choice architecture in various ways. And I think it's really, really important that we think about how, what kind of structures we are creating and what kind of scaffolding we are creating. And I think, I think that's kind of like, it sort of pushes in both directions. And yeah, modeling behavior is actually better than evangelizing, I think, in terms of being effective. I think you're right, appearing as normal people on protest, yeah. My brother always tries to look as like, like normal as possible whenever he goes, and I totally see that. And I also think as someone who used to do a lot of activism and does much less now, I think the people you're around is hugely, has a huge effect, and I think it's really important. So I think, being aware of this and um, re engaging with the empirical literature on this, I think is really important. Um, I thought it was intriguing how you link the categorical imperative in, because I was thinking first, yes, the categorical imperative and the golden rule, um, you know, what if everybody did that, could be very powerful and important here, but can we like nuance them? Can we make them a bit better? Because sometimes you know everyone else isn't going to do that, or sometimes a few people can do it, and then it's just about working out who should get the permissions. And I, I think, I think it needs to be molded a bit but then when you said because it's modeling behavior I was like now I get it I, I get it that not modifying it might be helpful actually not making the scheme as efficient as possible so that some people get to do something you know you might want to ban cows from the city center but give a few permits to disabled people for example but the idea is if you if you've got some universal thing I think can be really helpful um in terms of modeling and the social structures, I think modeling creates norms and expectations in ways then, then we can subvert, but sometimes we're trapped by them to a certain extent. So there's a Mara Marin book, I think that's what she's called, that's um, really interesting, that's working on Iris Young's work that tries to take it in this sort of direction about thinking about how we reproduce structures, but also how we can subvert them. Uh, I really enjoyed that um, for reading on, on a little bit about that. So yeah, it's something I'm really interested in and I, I want to look into more and I think it would definitely help with giving the reason because the reason you do it is not because of what you're doing but because what it signals to others. And I think there's a Holly Lawford Smith paper about this with regards to environmental activism. The reason that you, you do the recycling or whatever is not because of the effect of it, it's because of the effect of doing it visibly and signaling. Okay, Actually, I think I've combined two papers now. She's got two different papers. Anyway, I'll cut it off there. Yeah, we have uh, three, at least three more questions, which I would like to get in. Hugo. Hi, <laughs> thank you for your talk. Um, one of the, I'm not a philosopher. Uh, uh, Carol invites me to these things because I'm a multidisciplinarian. So I'm going to bring in some ideas that may be tangential uh, to start, but I think we'll have bearing on this. <clears throat> I'm not sure what you're saying about the value, if, if the value of individual contributions change depending on the circumstances in which they're contributed. A couple of times you've talked about the value of somebody's contribution. One has been whether there's insufficient surrounding activity to actually push this over a threshold. Does that diminish the value of somebody's individual contribution if you need X? Uh, and, do you, and you don't do it. So does that mean that that value is meaningless? The second time you've out, uh, talked about value was whether somebody has an outside influence, outsized influence, and whether their contribution is more value because you think it would have more influence. So I'm interested if you think these contributions have different kinds of weights of value. <clears throat> and in some instances, I can tell you that the Torah answers this question 
uh, I had a, 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 I got my MBA at, at NYU and my accounting professor was a, actually a PhD in philosophy, Professor Sorter. And he was talking about inventory management. And uh, he talked about, you need 10 people in, in a Jewish prayer circle to make what's called a minion. And the question that the Torah asks is, is the 10th person who completes the minion more important than the first person who starts the minion? And the Torah answers, no, the values are equal because without the first person, the 10th person would be the ninth person. So that happens to be a business problem. And I suggest you look at inventory management. I really couldn't help thinking that almost all of the questions you asked about whether there is sufficient impetus in a group or collective action is actually a common business problem with whether you have enough materials in order to create or manufacture something and you need different inventory levels. You're talking about inventory levels of individual actions combining into a combined action. That's a common business problem and there's a lot of mathematics behind it. And you may want to sort of look at that stuff. Um, the final comment is about the individual calculation of the value of their collective action. Um, look at the differences in response to the wars in Iraq and the Ukraine. I can tell you that every individual imam decided that it was not in their best interest to pick up arms against the Taliban. And a lot of Ukrainians thought it was in their best interest to pick up those Stinger missiles. And look how impossible it was to calculate the value of those individual contributions to a combined outcome. It's really iffy to put value on, on any of those individual contributions. And I can't resist one little anecdote as I'm old enough to know it. Uh, Bob Dylan met John Lennon in Woodstock in 1969 and said, you never, the Beatles don't write any political songs. You are followed by 3 billion people on earth and you're not trying to influence the outcome of politics. Uh, shame on you. And John Lennon wrote, imagine as a response to that criticism. So there is, I think, a case to be made that outsized people do have uh, an outsized obligation uh, to, uh, to affect things. I don't know, I don't think I really had any questions, but I, I suggest you look at these other, um, your, your questions are very tangential to other common problems. Yeah, I think it's a real pattern that these kind of problems repeat themselves. These sort of collective individual problems repeat themselves across our fields. Um, I, yeah, um, it seems really arbitrary that things beyond your control change the value of the same action. Um, but I think what really matters in these cases is it's not how things actually turn out, but what you knew at the time and what you should have done giving the know at the time. And if it turned out what you could do was really valuable at that time and you knew that, that's a bit different to if you knew that it wasn't going to do any good. Um, just as, you know, you know, if you're the Beatles, what you think is going to make a big difference compared to if you're not. Um, right. Yeah. It's sort of like um, and thing. Is there a unit of, of action that has equal value no matter where it's placed or does it matter if it influences the outcome? It's, it's uh, a utilitarian argument. I think they're all affected by context. I was going to say murdering somebody is always bad, but then like murdering somebody in a particular pattern of action is a holocaust and that's even worse, right? So it does matter. Um, well, ask Virginia about the value of care. Uh, uh, about okay, okay. And I do need to read more about care ethics. Yeah, I definitely take that point. Um, yeah, but no, thank you. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll have a look at some of that. Okay. Um, so I wanted to ask you a few things. Um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll let Alex come back with another question. Um, so uh, I'm a little bit, it's, it's partly methodological, but it's, um, I think that your kinds of cases um, are, work well for something like crowdsourcing. I think your kinds of cases are, uh, work best or the kinds that you, the way you're thinking about activism is kind of modeled more on crowdsourcing than it is on uh, political activism. And I think that's a problem because it's quite aggregative. And so it lends itself to voter paradox kinds of um, solutions. But 
Uh, I don't think that it's adequate to real world activism in the broader context because individuals don't just merge for a particular, um, you know, particular outcome. It's good for like capturing murderers online or something like that to think in this way. Uh, but the real world cases involved in um, addressing injustice or accomplishing global justice are really much more complex. And I think they involve uh, a range of other factors that would also influence what we take to what we mean by pattern or pattern guided reasoning, because um, it, it, it's very, uh, which is the problem that I have, in fact, as you know, from your comments on my APA paper, with the framing of structural injustice merely as a question of what we should do together aggregately, basically, to address it. Though I think that's a reduction of what she really had in mind, uh, Young may have had in mind, but even, um, you know, uh, so there's the intermediary of institutions, social movements, civil society organizations, and a framework of, of human rights morally and and institutionally embodied that would really be an aspect of the pattern as well as anti-capitalist, anti-racist uh, structural factors that we should really have as part of our pattern if we're gonna be able to choose what is best to do. So I just think it's kind of oversimplifying and distorting the situation to look at it as just what an individual should do with respect to a particular collectivity that gets together to accomplish a particular end. Um, and also, I think in those terms, I mean, my own view, respect then would really not directly like link to, um, yeah, uh, you know, uh, and be sufficient here. You'd have to think of the respect leads to a, a, a notion of human rights as a way of approaching global justice that requires that we su uh, support institutions that would realize everyone's human rights. It brings in notions of care, but it also brings in notions of solidarity that can be effective. Um, and, you know, in terms of what guidance I would give to people, they should join solidarity movements. Um, and that is not aid, it's not oriented to aid, but it's oriented to uh, establishing justice. Um, so I just think the situation is so much more complex that, that just talking about it in the terms you do, it doesn't, um, doesn't do justice to the real world complexity of the politics, as well as the social and political philosophy that is really, people have to have, they, it doesn't mean they have to agree on, on the meaning of justice or, you know, I don't want to say that, but it just isn't political enough in a certain way. Although it was great. <laughs> the, talk, the talk was great. No, 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 no. no. I, mean, you know, I think you're right. It I think in its framework, it was wonderful, but the no, but it, big it, enough. you skewed it. You skewed it because it, it's a false idealization. There's a reason why these accounts are about things like voting and things are really simple. And the kind of politics that I'm talking about is not voting. It's not about the numbers, right? In the same simplistic way where you just add the numbers and when they hit the threshold, that's not how collective organizing works. That's not how collective power works. It's much, much more complicated than that. And it's clearly a simplification. And I think there is an interesting question about, I know it doesn't work like that, but I think I'm trying to model it to try and make it a problem that I can tackle. And I think it's interesting to look at what features need to come in and how those features change things. So at one point I started thinking about the difference between, so I was thinking about a case in which um, people, um, it, there's enough people to achieve a political outcome, but do I still join anyway? And I was thinking, well, if I just join to add a number on the petition, I sign my name, I click on something, or I show up on the street and I walk, then there is no point. But if I actually go along to meetings and I take on some of the burdens of organizing, it really does help because some people get to spend some more time with their family and to be less stressed, right? And so the I only, relieve their burdens. And I think- the only case is like that. What's a case like that? It has to be very small scale. 
where you know that it's going to, you know, or there's a strong likelihood that it will actually accomplish a political outcome. Maybe removing an administrator at Columbia University would be an example. We all do a petition or whatever. But what kind of case is that going to be? It's going to have to be awfully small scale. It's still a false idealization, right? Right. So I, I mean, well, it's what just. What do I need to do? Work, do I need to? Well, I think, I think maybe look at real political movements and find out what actually right. is going on and what the reasons there are there, a, right? There is like John Judas has written. The reason I mentioned crowdsourcing is that that is contrasted with the sorts of networking that social movements engage in by John Judas and his argument, you know, reflections on Occupy Wall Street, for example, and that kind of thing. Why do movements like that or civil rights work? Uh, you can't just look at them as crowdsourced movements where a group of people get together um, and, you know, click on, click, essentially click or something like that. There's networking among the social movements. It's a very important contributor to their success. Um, there, and, and, these, and so solidarity as a networking notion is stronger than just the voting idea or the aggregative idea of crowdsourcing. Uh, so it's a whole different model of what makes social movements work. And that's what worries me here, even on the smaller scale of when we're talking about social movements or protests, um, you know, protest as part of a social movement or protest as episodic and we just get together and do it. That makes a big difference for the success of these things. And yeah, the way and I, movements draw on other social movements that have been successful, try to link up with them, like the, the whole uh, U.S. ones modeling them on Latin American social movements. I mean, social movement theory would be a very important uh, thing to look at uh, to just oversimplify my question, among other things, but especially that. Because this has been studied a lot, the efficacy of social movements, the efficacy of protests has been studied a great deal in sociology, especially social theory. Exactly, and this model of a moral philosopher just making a false idealized version of it and then trying to reason through that is not particularly helpful, right? Which is why I really want to move towards this kind of research where I look much more about the empirical literature and I also look at people on the ground because I think if not, I, I'm, I just not don't empirical. have the problems. All right, it's not yeah. just empirical, it's a different model that they are proposing is what I'm suggesting. Or it's a model uh, that, is, uh, that has media, the mediation of social movements and civil, uh, especially. It has to be part of a movement to be effective, except on a small scale. And I also like how you link it in with the problem with the theorizing about the injustice as well because there yeah. are some things that the aggregative model can't cover. I think people are tempted towards either this is aggregative, it's just adding up, or it's the collective, whereby the collective can be treated as an agent in a non-problematic way. And I think that's what you've been trying to get to the bottom of the, the work recently, because oh, yeah. both of them are not representative of the actual thing and how it works. Right, right. Nor is the simple model of, we're all just trapped in these social norms that we reproduce, because some people right. are, getting mm -hmm. empowered off these. Some people have a lot more power over these and are really benefiting from them and power maintaining and them, right? And it's structural power in a very uh, objectified sense. It's embodied in the functioning of institutions. And if you just, you know, protest is extremely important, but it also has to, has to involve, the patterns would have to involve some understanding of institutions and how they intermediate. Because otherwise yeah, you're not being be just there. You're not gonna be successful, yeah. They need change. And that requires also a connection to politics and law. The whole thing is very complex to really make significant social change. So, yeah. Okay. Anyway, Alex, that was enough out of me <laughs> as a moderator. Alex, and we'll just take a few quick follow ups and we should end soon. Alex. Right. So, I, I, I guess I, thanks, thanks to Carol's questions, I was able to put together my big question. And that's, I think, I think there's a lot of individualism going on in the model as presented. And I think a lot of times when we protest, when we do political action, we are thinking qua group members. So an example of a social action that really happened and really worked um, comes from my indigenous nation, the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. 
1969, we were 1970, sorry, we were one day away from having our tribal government dissolved by the U.S. federal government. And Choctaw's regular folks, deeply impoverished folks, um, for the most part, gathered up their solidarity networks, their kinship networks, and alerted each other that this problem was coming changed the and, and, and changed the uh, the tribe's official position on this, which was, yeah, we'll take it um, to no, we want to keep our government and uh, not accept a payout in exchange for our dissolution. And this movement spiraled into something that became uh, became an institution. And I guess the reasoning behind this that um, many Choctaws who participated in this um, said was basically because we were proud to be Choctaws. And there's this idea of being a good member of my group or even just being a member of my group is why I participate in this direct action. And I think we can think of that even when ours isn't the oppressed group. When I want to be a good American citizen, I want my nation not to go around oppressing others or to oppress subgroups um, within America. And I consider it part of being a good citizen to try and direct us to do less bad stuff. And um, yeah, so these ideas of solidarity, of networks, of, of groups forming together um, that then do even bigger action with other groups I think I think that's a really promising avenue. Um, there's also a lot of a lot of more recent um, stuff from indigenous scholars in Canada on like the Idle No More movement, where they just look into how that succeeded and didn't succeed in changing things for for indigenous Canadians. And that that could be of interest to you um, as far as like how uh, how real activists are like reflecting on what worked and didn't in exactly these kinds of situations. So yeah, that's, that's my thought. Yeah, thank you ever so much. Um, there's, there's just a lot to take home there, basically, I think. Um, thinking about how these things work, and then I guess thinking about how integral different contributions are to that. But then what you said, towards the end suggest that it's about not, it's not actually about individualistic moral reasoning, it's about re-reasoning that's identity-based, right? So I read something recently that said the abolition of slavery in England worked like that. Basically, because it was an empiristic thing, the arguments that ended up working were ones about how this is not British rather than how this is immoral. People knew it was immoral, but they had to think that this was bad, bad for Britain in a sense, for Britishness apparently. It's 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 in an article that attacks um, that says that it doesn't always have to be the kind of democratic contestation that Addison suggests that it was. Um, but in Britain, because they were so far away from the slaves, they had this internal conversation about who they were rather than having slaves go look with people. For fuck's sake, we're going to mess up your. I'm going to stop swearing. Um, okay, so I, I need to think more about that because that's a, that's a huge revolution in thinking for the model that I've been working on. Because I I'm I am nervous. I'm nervous about cultural group and, and national group thinking. It, it, it does scare me. Uh, but he, I think it I have doesn't this... have to be identitarian, does it, Alex? It doesn't have to be identity groups. It can just be groups that you feel affiliated with. No. Yeah. Yeah. And it doesn't. So I'm not I'm not necessarily afraid of it being identity group based when when a part of your group identity becomes wanting solidarity with others, which has really become a part of indigenous identity in in North America and beyond. There's other group based identities where this is going to really it, it could become very dangerous. And that's the case. But, yeah, it can totally be other kinds of group-based identities um, or sorry, not identity-based groups, but affiliation groups. Like, like when you mentioned trade unionism, that's um, 
it's a lot better to join in the union than uh, than pro than try to strike on your own and 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 the like. <laughs> I mean, my account never suggested that, right? That it's not individualistic in that sense. Individualistic I didn't think so. In two sense. It's individualistic in sense the ultimate units of moral worth are individuals, right? And it's individualistic as in, I need to think what reasoning individuals should make about this. And I think I'm quite committed to those two. Everything else I'm quite keen but to change. they're social beings. Yeah, the of course they are. Okay, well, you got to emphasize that part. Yeah, of course, of course. But I, I was explaining in which ways it's individualistic. And now I think pushing away either of those is going to be, I don't think I want to do that. But everything else I think is up for grabs. The fact that the individual should join the social group or should apply we reasoning to their decision making could be possible within this model. Um, I mean, obviously, yeah, they live in it. I don't mean obviously, but obviously loads of people don't accept this, but I, I, I accept that this is a social context in a really important ways. And I, I'm keen to do that. I'm just hanging on to these two parts of individualism. Um, but on the ground, what does that mean for my account is, is the question I have to ask what, what this we reasoning and this group identity reasoning rather than directly moral reasoning, um, whether that's, important here and necessary or, or, or valuable here anyway i'll stop talking because i'm i'm no longer being useful okay we have one more hopefully short question from callum yeah or sorry this is just a quick suggestion about responding to this criticism and uh i'm a dissertation student of carol's so <laughs> responding to carol's criticisms is uh all of uh what i'm trying to do at the moment so um I think you could just sort of frame it, set it up by saying something like, look, I'm not trying to give an account of everything that goes on with hard decisions individuals have to make with respect to uh, social movements. But sometimes problems like this arise. And I think like for me, listening to the talk, I could point to a bunch of times over the last you know, few years when I've had to make decisions about whether to um, you know, go along to that march or, um, uh, you know, keep paying my dues to this political party or this organization or whatever. And often thinking through those decisions, you do get pulled into some of the trains of thought that you model, you do in, in, the, uh, in the talk. So it's not that this is sort of a, a grand theory of how to navigate, how individuals should navigate social movements and social change, but it's helpful for thinking through a particular practical problem that does arise for individuals when they're, they're navigating that world. It's not the only problem that strikes them, it won't be helpful for everything, but it will be helpful for some of them. Um, and I feel like you could easily generate some nice examples that will be intuitive and um, helpful. Yeah, I think that is helpful and I, I think that is good, but I am interested in this bigger question as well about how individuals should relate to injustice. Um, so I think for the sake of a paper, that, that's very helpful. But I, I'm quite interested in thinking, can I add details to this overly simplistic model that can allow me to morally theorize about more realistic circumstances? Um, I just want along those lines, one question about your pattern based reasoning. You, you said something about that it would be sufficient to produce an outcome, right? And so I'm wondering what that means in the case of transformative social change. Because how do we know? Also some of the other questions that came up, the idea of unexpected consequences is very important with respect to protests. Because in retrospect, you know, I mean, movement and the emergence of these and their success is very hard to predict. Um, you know, even for um, so sociologists and so forth. I mean, they come up and they are successful in very unexpected ways. It seems very unlikely right now that we could have like an effective climate change movement, but that's what we thought back in the, in the 60s too. And it had, you know, the movements of the late 60s had some impacts in terms of feminism and so forth uh, and civil rights and anti-war. So how much uh, certainty are you, are you building or how much does that affect your idea of how does the outcome 
expectation work, as I think one of the other questioners uh, posed? So I think the model needs to bring in, and it's missing this intense uncertainty, right? The fact that we really don't know the answer to these questions. We yeah, don't know that, how what's going to be effective. Doesn't that affect what you, the way you specifically define pattern-based reasoning? Hmm. Yeah, because what I was trying to do was to avoid superfluous acts being included. So there is this puzzle around, um, I've dealt with it somewhere else, around this idea of, if you say these bunch of things together are causally relevant to that, um, you can say this set causes that, right? But then you can put random items in the set and it's still true that this set causes that. So how do you solve that problem? You come up with something like, it's a necessary part of a sufficient set in order to avoid superfluous outcomes. But of course there's multiple sets, right? So anything that can be a necessary part of a sufficient set can go in. So if you're thinking about different movements and different patterns of activities and different, let's face it, you're gonna to have to form actual collectives here with decision-making mechanisms, I think, for any of this to really work. I think that's part of making this real, right? Um, there are various different um, collectives that could form that could then achieve this outcome and there are various things that these collectives could do and there's various members but the idea is just to try and keep out anything um, irrelevant and the way you do that is you're irrelevant if you can't be a necessary part of any set so that doesn't mean that you're being really like strict we'll have just those people and if you're not just that people that produce that that's the answer and the truth is we have all this uncertainty so we don't know I think it's just a sort of it's a model for trying to, to put down a definition so that I can't say that me like I don't know doing yeah, yeah, a dance in my room contributes to the anti-war movement right it, I, we need some way of differentiating irrelevant from relevant acts Okay. Anyway, that was really interesting. And I think uh, we have to bring it to a close, but it was great. And we'll have you come back in person sometime. But thank you very much, Beth. It was really terrific. Um, can I just say thank you so much for having me and for all of the really important things that made me think and made me pull faces a variety of like, ah, oh, that's terrible. It's going to destroy everything. And that's great. And I need to look into that more. And I, every, every single, um, Every single person's brought something really, really helpful here, and I found it incredibly stimulating. And to be honest, that's not always true when I do talk. So thank you ever so much. If anyone can email me with references, thoughts, comments, I love it. I realize most people don't have time and I've written down everything I can, but if you can, I, I would love that. I know some people don't always like that, but I, I really do. So, um, and, and thank you so much. This has been so thought provoking. It was really good. It was really interesting. And, uh, yeah, we'll look forward to your next visit in person.